In this video, we're gonna talk about what a radius arm is. We're gonna talk about what radius arm bind is. We're gonna talk about how the top overlanding axle swap prevents radius arm bind. We're going to talk about uh, why we use radius arms instead of a three link or a four link and the performance it actually gives us to choose a radius arm over a four link in this case. Stay tuned. So what is a radius arm? Let's talk about what a radius arm is. So this here is one way of doing it. This is a lower control arm with an upper locating arm tied back to the lower control arm. So that's what makes this a radius arm. But a radius arm is any arm where the axle cannot pivot away from that arm. So as you can see, this lower control arm and upper locating arm configuration makes it so the axle can't pivot away from the arm. This is a radius arm. You'll find that a radius arm is any length that bolts to the frame at one end with one point and is bolted to the axle at the other end with at least two points. Ford, newer Ford trucks, newer Dodge trucks do the same thing on their front axles. It looks a little different. This is all sheet metal instead of individual links like this, but it accomplishes the same thing. Ford in the uh, 60s and 70s used this other style that uh, sandwiched the axle with a clamp around a wedge shape cast on piece on the axle tube and that where it accomplished the same thing where it could not pivot away from the radius arm that is what's technically a radius arm Our usual favorite stop pick and pull just got through admissions so the literal first row the first vehicle on the first row was the one truck that i thought i wasn't going to see which is an older ford with radius arms you never see these junkyards so there it is, that's a Dana 44. And then if you look, it's got a radius arm, okay? But these radius arms are not your traditional radius arm. You may note that at the axle end, it's just a rubber bushing clamped around a wedge-shaped, this wedge-shaped piece on the axle housing. And then it's a pretty short arm, and then it goes back to there. And you'll note that that's not actually a pivoting joint either. That's just a bushing. So there's no pivot this way. All of the movement is done by just the, the pressure and flex of that bushing. Now you also notice how wide the two radius arms are spaced from each other when they're mounted at the frame. That's the exact width of the frame. So they're short. They have no pivot in them at all. So the bushings have to do all of it. Now over here is a four link. Now this is a non-triangulated four link, but it's a four link. So let's say this arm, this lower control arm here, it's attached at one point and one point, which means the axle itself can pivot away from this arm. It can do that. The upper locating arm or the upper control arm is what keeps it at least pivoting in a controlled manner. I just showed you a radius arm, now I'm showing you a link. It just links two points, that's all it does. So you'll find these, they're long, short, parallel, triangulated, whatever. This is a link. So a four link has two lower control arms and two upper control arms. In some cases they're double triangulated so that it does not need a pan or a track bar to locate it under the axle, under the car. Or they are parallel like this one, or they're non-triangulated so they do need a pan or bar or track bar keep the axle located under the vehicle. That is always the case. A three link will always need a pannered bar or track bar, and a four link may not need one if it is double triangulated, meaning the upper control arms and lower control arms are on this opposing triangulation set. Okay, so this is my son's old RC car from when he was like five years old. This has two different link setups on it, you can see if you can tell. So the rear has a truly triangulated four link. Okay, so you can see it goes from wide to narrow and then wide to narrow. This is a triangulated four link. And so that triangulation is what affords such flex because both setups are very triangulated. And this is what you see on some pretty, you know, serious builds, competition buggies. But as you can see up around here, if this was a full-size rig, good luck getting a fuel tank to squeeze in there. Look, 
you have no room for fuel tank. You have no room even really for exhaust unless you get really creative with your exhaust. Uh, so a triangulated four link is not ideal for most vehicles that are not purpose built. I've gotten a lot of people that have been contacting me and saying that um, radius arms are bad because they bind. And that's true, but all links bind. All links bind. Radius arms aren't somehow different in that, in that way. But what you do find is the people that are uninformed on uh, radius arms, they don't know what they've seen and why that's different. So for example, let's talk about where radius arms sort of originated. The, as far as I know, one of the first, if not the first um, vehicle to come equipped with radius arms was Ford. They started doing it way back, like the 60s. But these radius arms are not your traditional radius arm. You may note that at the axle end, it's just a rubber bushing clamped around a wedge shaped, this wedge shaped piece on the axle housing. And then it's a pretty short arm, and then it goes back to there. And you'll note that that's not actually a pivoting joint either. That's just a bushing. So there's no pivot this way. All of the movement is done by just the pressure and flex of that bushing. Now you also notice how wide the two radius arms are spaced from each other when they're mounted at the frame. That's the exact width of the frame. So they're short. They have no pivot in them at all. So the bushings have to do all of it. And with such a thin, I mean, look at this, this is just barely over an eighth inch thick at this end. With such a thin bushing at the axle end, there's not any appreciable give at the axle end. So this is basically just locked on. So you really don't get much flex out of these. What I mean is that not all four links are better than radius arms. Their four links are not inherently better than radius arms. And I know that we have this sort of perpetuated belief that that's true, but it's just not true. So what I will uh, say is that, for example, you remember this video that I did here, where I put this radius arm suspension up against a Jeep JK with the non-triangulated four link on it. And I outflexed it by like half over again more. So we know that just because it's a four link, it isn't better. And just because this is a radius arm, we know that that isn't inherently worse either. And so let me, let me show you. So the rear of this Tahoe has a non-triangulated four link on it. Look at this mount. That's because it's been binding so hard against itself on flex, it's actually bent the mount. But these radius arms, there's no bent mounts. I mean, look, these are still, these are still parallel. These are still parallel. You got some kinks right here from Bash and Rocks. Okay, so here's the radius arm configuration of the Tahoe landing axle slot. And what makes radius arms bind, as I showed you in the junkyard on those Fords, those two radius arms are nearly parallel. Is that when they're fairly close to parallel or parallel, the more you can triangulate the mounting points of a link, a radius arm or any link, the less it will bind. So this one here, as you can see, we start here and we taper back to here. So instead of having the radius arms mount straight under the frame, as they often do uh, with solid axle conversions, most if not all link mounts and cross members that you'll see either made by people or sold, put the radius arm mount here, out directly under the frame. So we've triangulated that to be eight inches further inboard per side. So we've actually narrowed the mounting point of these radius arms up 16 inches from where they would be if you were using the same style of um, cross member that you see on most GM solid axle swaps. And the reason why that's important is that just the triangulation of that gives you a lot more potential for flex. And the reason why we, why we did that is that's actually just the organic angle that the, um, the organic angle that the uh, radius arm mounts on the Dodge axle were already at. This is just straight back. If we really wanted to, if someone wanted to get ambitious, 
and they wanted to put a little bend in the lower control arm section of the radius arm, they could probably move these mounts even further in. But the exhaust is kind of here, see, and the whole beauty of the Tahoe overlanding axle swap is that you don't have to change your exhaust or any of that. So if you're doing links on any vehicle, the more narrow you can make the mounting points to each other, and the wider you can get them out at the axle, the better. If you compare that, we have essentially exactly 39 inches center to center on the Dodge axle. So these are wider here. And narrower here by far than what you're seeing done on other radius arm swaps uh, on GM's full-size trucks. But here, so we go from 39 inches at the front to 26 and a half inches here. We make a 13 inch dive, which gains a lot of flex and limits radius arm bind considerably to go tapered as much as we can. In fact, if you were really building a really crazy, try to like make a high flex radius arm setup, guys are actually taking and moving these two mounting points and putting them dead in the center, basically as close together as possible. And then these radius arms flex as good as you could possibly hope for. As good as a four link you've ever seen, because the reason why you see these four links flexing so much, that's nothing to do so much with it being a four link as it is with the links being triangulated. So when you see four link suspensions and even three link suspensions that are flexing like crazy, it's not because inherently they are a four link or a three link. And when you see radius arms that are binding, it's not inherently because it's a radius arm. It's the type of suspension setup that you find with those vehicles. So if you're comparing your radius arms to four radius arms, guess what? You have a bad representation as I've shown earlier in the video. So the goal is to make sure you understand what you're looking at. Then there's also the case of non-triangulated four link. So it's not inherently better, though a lot of people for some reason seem to think that just because it says four link in the name, it's better than a radius arm. Okay, so here's a Dodge, and this is the generation of Dodge that we use uh, for the donor axles on the Tahoe overlanding axle swap. Just this week, I did have someone ask me if it would be possible to swap and use the Dodge parallel short arm four link in a Chevy instead of a radius arm because he was under the impression that radius arms weren't uh, as good as a short arm non-triangulated four link. Well, let's take a look here. First things first, look how short those things are. I mean, they're, they're tiny. Okay, there's not a lot of uh, length there. But you need to remember one thing. These aren't actually true pivoting bushings. So these bushings here are an outer sleeve with an inner sleeve that are encapsulated, sealed together with rubber. So there's actually no twisting available on these bushings. So you see this? That's the lip of the outer sleeve that presses into the arm. And then the inner sleeve is what the bolt goes through. And you see that rubber right there? That was vulcanized rubber that seals those two together. So as this suspension goes up and down, that rubber is actually twisting, fighting itself because there's no true pivot to these bushings. And that's true for basically any rubber bushing. So these aren't technically a uh, pivoting joint either. They really aren't. They're just held in by a bolt. They don't actually pivot or swivel like a polyurethane bushing will or a Johnny joint or a Heim joint or anything. These don't truly pivot either. So they're almost as bad as the Ford ones. In fact, I would say they're about the same in my own experience because these don't provide a ton of flex if you use these. And as a side note, if you ever are replacing arms or reinstalling arms or bushings on anything with that style of bushing, you actually need to have the vehicle under its own weight and at ride height before you tighten the bolts down. Because if you do it while it's on the lift or jacked up, that bushing is now neutral, tightened down, pointed downward. Or if you do it stuffed all the way upward, so when you put it under its own weight, it's actually already twisting and binding that bushing. So you want to find the neutral position to be your starting point. Otherwise, you will just obliterate the bushings um, sooner rather than later. So I'm trying to just dispel the myth that radius arms just inherently bind. It's just true for all links. Link suspensions just bind. And you will often see when someone puts extra effort into a link suspension that you get more flex. And it's not because they're necessarily going with a radius arm so much as it is they're going with more effort 
and making more concessions on their build that you wouldn't normally do unless you were building a super purpose built rig. Okay, so this is my son's old RC car from when he was like five years old. This has two different link setups on it. You can see if you can tell. So the rear has a truly triangulated four link. Okay, so you can see it goes from wide to narrow and then wide to narrow. This is a triangulated four link. And so that triangulation is what affords such flex because both setups are very triangulated. And this is what you see on some pretty, you know, serious builds, competition buggies. But as you can see up around here, if this was a full size rig, good luck getting a fuel tank to squeeze in there. Look, you have no room for fuel tank. You have no room even really for exhaust unless you get really creative with your exhaust. Uh, so a triangulated four link is not ideal for most vehicles that are not purpose built. As I showed you, I mean, look at this thing. If this was a, your Tahoe or your Suburban or your Silverado, you have stuff here that needs to work, fuel tanks and such. Look at all that stuff. Okay, same story but worse up here in the front. That's why you can't run a triangulated four link on the front. We have even more stuff, oil pan, catalytic converter, exhaust, cross members. I mean, look at this. You can't run a triangulated four link on the front of a vehicle without costing six, eight, ten inches of travel. Which leads me to another point. You actually can't put a triangulated four link in the front of a standard vehicle for one plain and simple reason. As I mentioned, double triangulated suspension doesn't need a pan or track bar. And what that means is that as it goes up and down, for the most part, it stays centered. And that is bad on the front of a vehicle. I know that seems kind of weird to think about. So this panhard slash track bar, as I discussed in this video, I've already linked to, its purpose is to locate the axle side to side so that the axle doesn't go where it shouldn't. But it's also important that this steering knuckle right here stays the same distance from the steering box here at all phases of suspension travel. So if this axle were to go straight up this way, okay, without going that way, traversing towards the passenger side slightly, which the track bar causes it to happen with, per with correct geometry, you get a bump steer situation because the axle goes straight up, which means this point is going this way, okay? And you'll get bump steer. So, that, so you hit a bump driving down the road, you go up, your steering goes this way, your suspension unloads again, it goes back down, and then you start doing this, okay? You are getting not only bump steer, but an oscillating bump steer. And that's why you physically can't or should not put a triangulated four link on the front of a street driven vehicle. And the way that you know this is combated is that anytime you do put a triangulated four link in a purpose built buggy that has a triangulated four link in the front, it does not have a drag link. Or if it does, the person just doesn't care about the uh, bump steer because they operate at such slow speeds, they just don't care. But in the case that you are operating at higher speeds and don't want to die, they, instead of having a drag link, go to a full hydraulic steering setup. Because then there is no difference in steering knuckle position as the suspension goes up and down. And that's something to you know, think about also because that's another one. As, long, as soon as you go to a full hydraulic steering, you're no longer a practical vehicle. You're now like an off-road only rig. And that's true for most states have laws explicitly saying that, that hydraulic only steering is prohibited on street driven vehicles. So you cannot put a triangulated four link on the front of this if you wanted to, and that is why.